Today on Uncommon Knowledge, is it time to vote out the Electoral College? Funding for this program is provided by the John M. Olin Foundation. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Our show today, the case for and the case against the Electoral College. A brief reminder of your junior high civics, for these 200 and some years now, the President of the United States has not been elected by a national popular vote, but by the Electoral College, an institution in which each state receives the same number of votes as it has representatives in Congress. Each state, large or small, therefore receives two votes for its members of the Senate, plus the same number of votes as it has members of the House of Representatives. Under this system, votes for president cast in small states, Wyoming for example, count more heavily than votes for president cast in big states, California, New York, or Texas. The question, has the Electoral College served the nation well, or should the Electoral College be abolished and replaced with a system under which every vote counts the same? Joining us today, two guests. Jack Rakoff is a professor of history and political science at Stanford University. He's also the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning book, Original Meanings, Ideas and Politics and the Making of the Constitution. Tara Ross is the author of the new book entitled, Enlightened Democracy, The Case for the Electoral College. Brief commentary on the way we select our presidents, quote, the mode of appointment of the Chief Magistrate of the United States is almost the only part of the system which has escaped without severe censure. I venture somewhat further and hesitate not to affirm that if the manner of it be not perfect, at least it is excellent. Alexander Hamilton. Would you agree with Hamilton that the way we choose presidents is indeed excellent, Tara? I agree completely. Jack? Uh, disagree significantly. With Hamilton? <laughs> well, I'm a Minnesotan, so it's easy. <laughs> All right. Uh, what were the electors think? What were the founders thinking when they gave us such a peculiar system as the Electoral College, Jack? They were thinking mostly about the problems that would arise if you had a popular election with a single national constituency on the one hand, or an election by Congress uh, on the other. And so, they the basic reason they adopt the Electoral College is not that they had any great confidence it would work as such that they had fewer objections against it than the other modes of election that they were considering. It was a compromise with which they were, Alexander Hamilton is typical or atypical? He was quite happy with the compromise, at least on the strength of that quotation. Of course, the interesting thing about Hamilton is, is that as soon as you start having contested elections in 1796 and 1800, he comes up with all kinds of schemes to manipulate the electoral system for, uh, for intensely partisan uh, considerations, and, and particularly because of his deep uh, uh, animosity and his deep distrust of John Adams. Mm. Tara? You want to tell us the founders liked their work or had nobler aims in mind? Jack is slightly dismissive in his description. I disagree with Jack a bit. Alexander Hamilton was typical, I think, of the founders who did not see much need to discuss this at the constitutional or at the conventions ratifying the Constitution. They thought the system was a good compromise between the large and the small states. And I I think it was. The small states, if there had been a direct national election, they would have been outvoted constantly by the large states. Legislative selection was the other idea that was discussed mm -hmm. at great length, and that would have left the president, as they said, a, a tool of the legislature, and it would have undermined their separation of powers, okay. goals that they were going for. Now let's talk for a moment about the way this thing has actually worked for this two, two, two and some centuries. I quote you, Jack, rather than view the electoral system as a well-conceived element within the overall constitutional design, we can recognize that it represented a highly experimental leap into political uncertainty. So the question is, how did the experiment work? And I want to quote you once again, the electoral scheme of 1787 was obsolete by 1800. Let's start with the problem of uh, why not have the president elected by the people? Right. The assumption in 1787 was that in a post-George Washington world, you would never have national characters, the term they used, sufficiently well known to overcome the kind of favorite son bias of a highly decentralized electorate. But the one thing we know is that as soon as Washington announces his retirement for the presidency in, in the summer of 1796, 
uh, we already get two highly mobilized, fairly disciplined political campaigns going, one supporting John Adams as the Federalist candidate, the other supporting Thomas Jefferson as the Democratic Republican candidate. And in fact, the nation could have made an effective choice between those two candidates. So the framers' reasons for doubting that popular election would work, that's back in 1787, the framers' reasons for thinking that popular election would not work are proved to be obsolete as soon as you have a contested election in 1796. In the sense that both of these people, Adams and Jefferson running in 1800, were national enough figures so that people in Massachusetts could form an adequate opinion of Jefferson, people in Virginia could form an adequate opinion of Adams. It would right. have sorted itself and, out. And, and, and you have a party apparatus that already is working very hard to kind of form working coalitions to support one, national one coalitions. Can, right, national coalitions to support one candidate or the other. Okay. Uh, Tara, what do you think about that election of 1800? Now, I, my point of view is that the Electoral College has adapted really well. The 1800 election was one tweak that occurred on the way. The, when the 12th Amendment was adopted a couple years later to separate the voting for president and vice president. I think the rise of the political parties has strengthened the system, mm -hmm. um, the rise of the two-party system, the winner-take-all system, popular votes in each of the states. These are all changes that have occurred over time. How many times? Let's continue to explore how well the Electoral College has worked in actual practice. How many times in American history has the Electoral College given us as president the candidate who lost the popular vote. That's four times? Two indisputably. Two indisputably. Yes. 2000 and, no, no. 1888 and 2000. 1888 and 2000. Mm -hmm. Oh, Quince, John Quincy Adams didn't lose the popular vote to uh, Andrew Jackson? I thought he did. I say indisputably yeah. because not all states were conducting popular elections at that time. Andrew Jackson won the, the, a plurality of the recorded popular vote, but lots of states did not. Oh, I see. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's two indisputably, maybe a third. Well, you so, can, let's, and the most interesting one actually is 1960, when Richard Nixon, in fact, had the popular plurality over John F. Kennedy, because in, in, in reporting the national popular vote, the two slates of Democratic electors, one of which was anti-Kennedy, were amalgamated in, in the reporting as, uh, as both Democratic votes. So if you take away the anti-Kennedy Democratic electors who wound up voting for Harry Byrd, you know, the old senator from Virginia, right. in 1960, if you subtract those from Kennedy's national popular vote count, which it makes a lot of sense to do because those Alabamans were voting against John Kennedy, Richard Nixon actually had, the, had a narrow uh, plurality in 1960. Let's run through the arguments in favor of the Electoral College before letting Jack open up this big birth <laughs> attack on the Electoral College. Federalism. Why does the Electoral College tend to enhance American federalism? I think the 1888 election in which the popular... 1888 is who? Grover Cleveland and Benjamin Harrison. Right. Grover Cleveland lost or lost the Electoral College, but won the popular vote. Right. And he came back four years later, and he won the election. He learned from the mistakes that he made in 1888. And those mistakes were that he focused too much on one region of the country, the southern region of the country. And he recognized what it is that the Electoral College wants people to do, and that's to reach out to a wide variety of people across the nation, and that's what our state-by-state -state voting process does for us. You're right, Tara. As the system stands today, that is to say, with the Electoral College, presidential candidates have no incentive to pull large margins in any one state. They therefore tour the nation mm -hmm. seeking to build a national coalition. But they don't really tour the nation, do they? Last presidential campaign, 2004, comes down to Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, a handful of other battleground states. Uh, California, New York, and Texas were so clearly locked up for particular candidates sure. that those three of the four biggest states in the country got scarcely any visits sure. at all, right? Okay, so... Sure. That appears true if you focus on one election in isolation. If you look at states' histories of votings, I would contend that actually my original statement is true. It encourages national coalition building. Maybe this year Ohio and Pennsylvania are the, and Florida are the ones that are in play. However, other states, they swing when they, and they become swing states, or they become no longer safe, or maybe swing states become safe, over time it changes. West, West Virginia, Virginia right, used to vote Democrat, now it's voting vote Republican twice in a row. It's considered a swing state. And Texas used to be Democratic, now it's Republican. California was Republican, now it's Democratic. If you look, again, after the 1800s, after Reconstruction, the divide wasn't by coastal with the middle section that's all red, it was north and south. It this changes is an over time. an argument for her to make to you as a historian. There are, right, over right, time, right, then, right. you get the national emphasis. Right. Actually, a lot of people have argued that the, the current electoral map is exactly the opposite of the 1896 map. But I, let's, let's talk about the, the current, the current okay. situation. You know, so the parties have strong regional bases. 
the, the Republicans in the big L I described, the, the Democrats, you know, on the coast, coast. And, and in the industrial uh, northeast. And if we assume the national competition is pretty evenly balanced, which I think on the whole it is, the Republicans have the advantage, which in some ways the Electoral College multiplies or, mm -hmm. you know, gives a little coefficient that favors the Republicans in terms of the current alignment. Then what we're likely to look at, I think for the indefinite future, barring another major realignment, is a pattern of campaigning very much like 2000, 2004, which most states will remain out of play, mm -hmm. and that the presidential election, which should be the one nas truly national election we have, right. in which the president election will, will repeatedly focus on a relatively small number of states, in which people living in California, New York, Texas, you know, many small states as well as many large states, uh, will feel, in a sense, disenfranchised, not that they've lost their vote or you know, not that their electoral votes don't count in the end, right. but they don't feel part of the campaign once the primary season is over. Uh, On to another argument in favor of the Electoral College, moderation and compromise. I quote to you George Will, Jack. America's constitutional system aims not merely for majority rule, but for rule by certain kinds of majorities. Nice little turn there, wouldn't you say? It aims for majority suited to moderate, consensual government of a heterogeneous continental nation with myriad regional and other diversities. Close quote. You can't just put together a coalition if you're a Republican of, let's say, Christian evangelicals, the so-called Christian right nationally. You have to go into a state and maybe you can build a base Christian evangelicals in this state, but you have to reach out to this group, this group. If you're a Democrat, you can't just take labor unions and liberals and build that across the nation. It forces you to go state by state and put together different kinds of coalitions, moderating what might otherwise be an extremist influence on the parties. This doesn't seem to describe where we are in terms of our political parties. Everybody knows the political parties have become much more ideological and much more polarized over the last generation. Uh, and there are a lot of ways to explain this. So, you know, there's, there's not much evidence from how, how the political parties as a whole are operating, since they're no longer Democrat conservatives or Republican liberals. The parties themselves have become too polarized for that kind of ideological, you know, coalition building really to describe the, the current state of American politics. I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to the 1880s again, but I think... Yeah, why don't we talk the, uh, about the 21st century? Why should we talk about the... You're the historian! <laughs> why? Close with her on the 19th no, century, will you please? Post 18, contact on 1880s. Go the ahead. The 1880s and today are very analogous. Well, we, we had popular vote loser presidents in each of those times. We had electoral maps that appeared the same election after election for at least two or three elections in a row each time. And in each instance, I believe that the Electoral College will encourage the parties to come together and, and to work with people who are not like themselves. And that's a great benefit of the Electoral College. In the 1880s, North and South, who had these huge differences, Civil War, Reconstruction, very emotional time for many people, they had to come together because the electoral map was so divided, nobody could be guaranteed victory unless they learned how to reach out to people that were not no, like no, themselves. That's a, that's a, you know, that's a that's, great point. That's because, happening because, today. because coming together in the late 19th century also involves the massive disfranchisement of African American voters throughout in the post-Reconstruction South. I mean, that's one of the most critical developments that takes place as part of the kind of party dealing that's going on in, in the late 19th century. That would be a horrible example of, you know, of any kind of principle, of, any kind of democratic principle that you'd want to build on today, especially with allegations about st interesting efforts to kind of make it more difficult for African Americans to vote in Florida I and even Ohio. I don't think that's what I'm saying forward. at all. That's a, that's a yeah. gross mischaracterization no, of what also, I just said. Go ahead. I said let, let I, what I said is that the Electoral College map was so divided that, that you have to reach out to somebody across the aisle from yourself. Another example of how this is promoting moderation and compromise that is healthy for our country, I think, if you're watching the Democrats after this election, they've lost two elections in a row, virtually the same electoral map. They realize that they have to reach out to other voters not like themselves. Pro-life Democrats are becoming much more vocal. And I Next, Tara's last argument in favor of the Electoral College. Let me quote you, Tara, and then you explain yourself. The argument here is that the Electoral College promotes stability and certainty. The Electoral College system, quoting you, Tara Ross, when combined with a winner-take-all rule, tends to magnify the margin of victory, giving the victor a certain and demonstrable elect election outcome. Close quote. Explain yourself. Because of the winner-take-all system, you end up with a higher percentage of electoral votes than you did popular vote. The electoral margin, I think, over the past century or so has been... Most, it's usually 200 votes or more that the, elect, that the president wins by, right. even though the popular vote margin is usually less than 10%. Now, here's the other, another point. 
also this one that I derived from your friend George Will. Um, the election of 2000 was the sixth in which the popular vote margin was less than 1%. Consider 1960, in which I made these notes before you brought out mm -hmm. this point about the anti-Kennedy Democrats. John Kennedy wins in the popular vote as conventionally construed in 1960 by 119,000 votes, which is just the margin by which George W. Bush won Ohio alone in 2000, and four, rather. So in 1960, if we'd had a single national election and Nixon had demanded a recount, instead of under the Electoral College, say 2000, it was contained in one state, 1960 would have overturned results in thousands of precincts, or at least caused trouble in thousands of the nation's 170,000 precincts. You've got, you're asking for trouble by electing presidents on a national basis. You know, I, I think the best answer to that is to think about everything we've learned about what a, uh, how our voting system actually operates. Mm -hmm. uh, the lesson was more vivid in 2000, to be sure, than it was in 2004. But we still know that there are lots and lots of glitches uh, in the way in which we vote. And, and, and the different segments of the population are more likely to be dis disfranchised in terms of having their votes you know, counted and counted accurately. It seems to me one of the great advantages of having a national popular at large election was that you would thereby be able at one, you know, at one fell swoop to adopt the one best system of voting, which in technical terms would be most likely to, you know, to produce, you know, the, the, the highest levels of accuracy in terms of counting. But you still have the occasional very close vote. Well, you still have right, you still the occasional very close vote, and that's why and you, you want that's, that's why you want it, that's why you want to have the, well look we were in turmoil in two thousand, so two things. One is the Electoral College isolates the problem to one or handful of states. In two thousand it was Florida, in two thousand four it was Ohio. Second in if we have it would have been Texas and Illinois probably. Sure. Right? All right. In second, if we had a direct national election, a national vote, it would become very easy to steal votes now in places such as let's say Texas where Republicans run their machinery, and it would suddenly matter. Today, if she you don't- She says speaking as a woman from Texas. So. I say speaking as a woman from Texas. Yeah, you're maligning your own state, which you're allowed to do. Go ahead. Today, it doesn't matter, because if you steal votes in Texas, the Republican, as you said, is going to win anyway. It doesn't matter. There's a disincentive to steal votes in places where it's easy to steal votes. In places where it's hard to steal votes, it might matter, but it's much more difficult to steal them there. If you open up to a nationwide, yeah. it suddenly becomes easy to steal votes, and it, the lecture would be a huge mess and you'd be recounting all over the country. The fundamental and now the fundamental argument against the Electoral College, it just isn't fair. Population of California, 35,484,000. Divide that by the state's 55 electors and you get one elector for every 645,000 people. Population of Wyoming, 499,000. Divide that by Wyoming's three electors and you get one elector for every 166,000 people, or a presidential vote cast in Wyoming counts almost four times as much in the Electoral College as a vote cast in California. The system works great. It gives minority groups a, the ability to make themselves heard. My, minority political interests, whether they be small states, or in some instances it works out, perhaps you could say the Jewish consistency in New York. Minority political interests have an opportunity to have a magnified voice from time to time. However, they don't have so much power that they can win as long as the majority is reasonable. When the majority is acting reasonably, it will get votes across the nation and it will win. Jack? The fact remains, as, as, you know, as your ratios demonstrate, that one of the fundamental problems with the Electoral College is that if you believe as a matter of principle, as I do, that one person, one vote should be the basic rule of a modern democracy, and that there are sufficient exemptions from that already in, in, in the form of the Senate, where, you know, which, which, which is re beyond the amendment part of the Constitution, uh, then, then it seems to me the, the, the argument for you know, minority rights becomes much more problematic. We better have every vote count equally Jeff, wherever it is cast. Where do you derive the principle of one person, one vote? Well, I derive it, I think, from the same principle that James, that James, moved James Madison in 1787 to say that in the final analysis, the popular vote was the best way to do it, that all citizens are equal. Madison is very explicit on this point. That it's one reason, for example, we have the time, manner, place clause, in, in, you know, which, which allows Congress to overrule state legislative regulations of, of elections for the House of Representatives, 
as Madison justifies it by saying, in effect, by saying, you know, we have to we have to worry about gerrymandering by creating districts right. of an equal size. So what I'm trying to get a grip on your argument here. Your argument is that there's a kind of um, also, my argument is all citizens are equal, and when we're voting for the, for and the that, one national office, the vote of every citizen should count the same wherever it's cast. And that Congress had to make some. Uh, uh, unsavory compromises in order to make the system work, and for example, the three-fifths rule, and, and, and indeed putting up with slavery, right. and that as the nation grow, we can more fully embrace what was true and just and noble back at the time, and that we now have reached a point at which we can do away with the Electoral College, which was, right. that's your right. position? Right. Okay, answer that one. Let's say for argument's sake that some of the founders went into the Constitutional Convention with the idea that one person, one vote should be the standard. Other delegates felt equally strongly that one state, one vote should be the standard. Rhode Island didn't send delegates at all because they didn't think it would be respected. Delaware was, their delegates were only authorized to vote for one state, one vote. The, the Constitution at the end was a compromise between all these conflicting interests and everybody thought it was a good plan. James Madison signed on to it. He wrote the Federalist Papers in defense of ratification of this Constitution. Jack, last topic, reforming or replacing the Electoral College. Jack, you give us your reform. How would you reform the Electoral College? I would have a single national constituency. Right. Um, I think one would have to worry about, and one obviously has to worry about what, how much of a plurality would you want to have to have a respectively elected president. So whether you set a, you'd want to set a threshold at 40% or 45%, or you might want to have runoff provisions. Uh, so you might so so if in fact you you wind up with three or four contender parties, which I actually think is highly unlikely, but you have to think about the contingencies, then you would have a basis for you know for you know for having you know having a second election two weeks later, the way the French you know sometimes do, uh, in order to make sure that the the president elected office has a respectable for at least plurality, uh, or hopefully majority right. in the vote. Okay, single national electorate. I'm quoting something you wrote. You're you're actually a little yeah. looser there than you yeah. were in what place? Were you? Single national electorate, 45 percent of the vote on the first round, or capture an outright majority in a runoff between the two high, highest finalists within two weeks of the initial election. How's that for a constitutional amendment? I think it sounds horrible. I, I think if we have... How would things... Let's, let's put it, let me ask you both to imagine this. How would 2004, the election of 2004, have been different under the Jack Rakoff uh, set of rules? Well, it would have had the same outcome because, because you know... Bush, because won, Bush would have won in both cases. That's the yeah. personal mistake, But how would mistake, they, but how would they that... campaign differently? Ah, how would they have campaigned? Oh, oh how would the campaign yes, be different? Yes. Well, the campaigns would have to be national. Both parties would have an incentive to turn out their votes wherever their votes were cast. Republicans would have a much greater incentive to turn out their votes in the Mountain West Mountain and, and in the Old Confederacy. Side. Democrats would have the same incentive in the Northeast. I mean, the parties have, at the moment, the candidates and campaigns have no incentive to try to turn out the vote or even to carry the campaign to non-competitive states. In 2004, when, under the Raycove yeah. system, the Democrats would have had just as fierce a get-out-the-vote effort in California and the Republicans just as fierce a get-out-the-vote effort in Texas you know, as both parties had in Ohio. You know, turnout in California actually declined. From, from, which is because, amazing. From 2000 right. to 2004, fewer, considering you know, several hundred thousand fewer votes were cast in the 2004 election in California than was the case in 2000. Because everybody said ho hum. Because everybody knew what the carry result will was. carry the state. All right. The principal mistake that electoral college opponents make is they say if you take the electoral college out of the system, nothing else will change. He says George Bush still would have won. No, George Bush would not have won for multiple reasons. One is, as you mentioned, campaign strategies would change. George Bush would go to Texas. John Kerry would go to, actually, he wouldn't even go to Texas. He'd go to Dallas and Houston. If you live in El Paso, forget it. If, if you're John Kerry, you go to Los Angeles and, and San Francisco. Why would you go anywhere else? Moreover, other third-party candidates would have incentives, incentives to join the race. Nader would get a ton more votes. George Bush would not have gotten 51% of the vote. I, I dare say over time, more and more candidates would enter, and we'd pretty much never, hit, I think you had a 45% um, cutoff, would never hit that 45% cutoff. Speaking we'd of highly experimental leaps into political uncertainty, she's accusing you of trying to voice just such a, an experimental leap upon us with the Rakoff reform. Look, we, we're running out of time, so let me ask you this. How would you get your reform enacted? Well, I think you'd have to have a serious, intelligent debate, not unlike the one that I, I hope we've had, or you know, notwithstanding the somewhat heated, you know, nature of my rhetoric. I mean, I do think you have to you have to try to discuss the issue intelligently. I think, among other things, you have to explain to small state voters, because they because because under the rules for constitutional amendment, they have the greatest potential for blocking an amendment. Why, in fact, the principle of one person, one vote. A is the best principle, and B will really not affect their interests properly. And do you defined. see the prospect for such a national conversation or 
education? I mean, is there interest? Yeah, I think so. But in, in part because, I mean, out of the last two elections, I think Americans in general are you know, much more aware of these phenomenon of the concentrated, highly focused campaign mm -hmm. and the sense of political, not disfranchisement in a little sense, but political disengagement. If we want to implement one person, one vote, we have to get rid of the Senate, too. And nobody wants okay, to do that. Okay, but we can't get rid of the we, Senate because it's constitutionally prohibited that's true. for all intents and purposes. <laughs> that is true. We can amend the Electoral College. But that, last question. Right. Alas, it's television. We have to bring it to a close. Former President Jimmy Carter, I, close, I quote, I would predict, James Earl Carter said, that 200 years from now, we will still have the Electoral College. Close quote. Will we? Well, Jimmy Carter said that to be <laughs> personally. And what did you say back? Uh, well, I, I think I would, if I had the chance to pursue the conversation, I'd say exactly what I just said, that that's true if we don't talk about it. If we talk about it and think serious about the arguments for and against, then I think we can understand why the kinds of defenses that Tara's offered here, as much as I respect her ability to defend them, really are fallacious. 200 years from now? Sure, but I think it's important for the American people to understand the benefits of the system they have in place. Tara Ross, Jack Rayko, thank you very much. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thank you for joining us. We welcome your comments on this week's show. Our email address, comments at uncommonknowledge.tv. For more information about Uncommon Knowledge, please visit our website, www.uncommonknowledge.tv. Funding for this program was provided by the John M. Olin Foundation.